if you can hear me and see okay good so um i will quickly recapitulate what we are doing here and let me share a screen so there is a google classroom <clears throat> website that uh, we've all shared a link with uh, with you so let me know if you can see my screen here Okay, so I am sharing my screen and what I am doing here is uh, creating materials for all of you that you can reference in the future and use it for your own um, Sunday schools. So all of these folders have a particular number. And so you have a 00, zero folder, you have a 0102. Zero zero so they're all in order of exact order of the um, classroom, uh, the class syllabus that we are following. So uh, I'm also going out in the future and I'm uploading material as and when people have requests. Like last time, somebody asked me about textbooks that they can use. So these are all freely downloadable textbooks. Um, these are written by me and they are being used by many different temples. You can just download them for free. They are, they are all PDFs, but if you need a word version, definitely ask me because you might just want to customize them for your temple. So send me an email, I can, I'll can. i be glad to share the uh, Word document with you. Someone else had also asked me a question on teenager programs and I will create another folder for that um, where um, you know, I'll upload certain um, events, description of events that you can have your teenagers participate in. Um, and then um, in the first class, we looked at you know, what's the purpose of this whole program uh, we briefly reviewed the syllabus, and um, then we also just briefly went through the um, slideshow of the architecture of Hinduism. Now, corresponding to that architecture, uh, we've created a two-page brochure, which prints on both the sides. So if you have a visitor to your temple, um, you can just download this brochure. It has our temple logo, but you can replace it with your own temple logo, or if you have some other institution, you can put on your logo. But um, it's a very um, non-sectarian and a very inclusive description of the architecture of Hinduism. So um, like I mentioned last time, uh, we need to start with our um, prayers. So um, what I will do is I will go back to the prayer slides before jumping into the topic um, that we have for this uh, day. So let me share my screen that has the prayer slides on it.
Oh, looks like I was on mute. I apologize. Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Gunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvinavadhi Tamastu Mavidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 So now I'll jump into the main topic of the today and um, whenever you're teaching an adult class on Hinduism or if you're teaching the teenagers, um, it's always good to start on an uplifting, inspiring, or a positive note. And so for that reason, um, the topic that we've chosen today is, um, you know, the gifts of Hindus, how Hindus have contributed to the global civilization. But before I jump into this topic, um, you know, what are the strategies? How do you really want to teach this class? Um, you don't just read from the slides. Uh, what I'll do is after this class, I'll upload a, a, you know, one page on strategies for teaching this class. So what I have done is I have created a box of things, artifacts that I show to the students. Um, and those could be as simple things like, you know, coins from different countries. Um, uh, for example, Kampuchea or for example, uh, Thailand. Um, I have been collecting currency notes also since I was a child. And so I also show those to them. Like, for example, um, you know, this is a bill from um, Sri Lanka. And, and so those, you know, I pass them around. Um, I also have a collection of books, which, uh, which uh, you know, explains how um, Hindu culture has positively influenced other cultures. So, um, so you know, it's it's good thing to create a box or of, of all those artifacts so that while you're talking to students, you pass them around and that keeps engaging them. And, you know, it's kind of like a proof that yes, you know, we have made positive contributions to the human society. Um, so now, like I mentioned, um, each of these slides has some text in the notes section. And, um, you know, when you're presenting these slides, don't just read them, uh, read the slides. What you say is meant to complement what's being displayed. Um, and um, so a lot of these slides might be excessive material for you, which is why I have uploaded them right as PPT. Um, you can delete the slides you don't want and you can edit them. You can add slides if you have more interesting material. If you have any other interesting material to add, definitely share it with me. So, um, but you know, we, we need to inform ourselves um, and educate ourselves before we can teach others. So the purpose of this slideshow is not to talk about Hindu communities that live in other parts of the world, but its purpose is to talk about how Hindus have influenced others, you know, which means um, how they have influenced non-Hindus. Um, so one thing that I do emphasize to students when I talk to them about Hindu influences is that a lot of other cultures, for example, how did the English language spread all over the world? The English uh, traders, you know, they first went as traders, for example, they came as uh, the East India Company to India. And eventually they, you know, made good use of um, the disunity amongst um, Indians and they came to rule India. So it's through colonialism and imperialism that a lot of other cultures and civilizations spread their values, their languages, their festivals, their religions, their food, their, their uh, linguistic vocabulary. But in the case of Hindus, we didn't push it by um, aggressively converting others, by invading others. Rather, we went as traders and people who came in contact with us, they found value in what we have to offer to them. And, and that's how Hindu influences have spread all over the world now. Um, and over the ages, there are many, many um, different agents of Hindu culture in more recent times. For example, we've had gurus and swamis. Um, and then uh, today, of course, we have Hindu immigrants who live all over the world. So here are certain maps that you can show to them. So I'm going to the next slide here. Um, so in the ancient world, even during the time of the Bronze Age civilizations, um, you know, you can tell them that in, in the whole world, there are two major sources of cattle breeds. One is the Bose Taurus and one is the, uh, the other one is Bose Indicus. And as the very name suggests, and you can read about that in the notes section, 
Bose Indicus is the humped cattle. And the advantage the humped cattle has is that it's more heat resistant. Uh, it, you know, for example, bulls and cows, they continue to be in a healthy state and provide milk in hot climates. So eventually, even in the Bronze Age, like 2500 BC, 2400 BC, that Bose Indicus cattle, which was first domesticated by the Hindus, spread into uh, Sumer and eventually even into the parts of Africa. Um, when we come to late ancient times and early medieval times, um, there were more trade routes and newer civilizations like Rome and Greece came up. So, you know, students know about these different cultures uh, more. And so now uh, Indian influences started spreading even, even faster. You know, on the East, India started exporting Hindu and Buddhist values and towards the West, um, even things like cotton and eventually, you know, games like chess, they spread um, to different parts of the world. And when we come closer to our times, um, you know, one um, impact of imperialism and colonialism was that there was a, a, a migration of Hindus to different parts of the world. So in ancient times, Hindus moved to places like Malaysia um, and to Indonesia, to Myanmar, Kampuchea. But in more recent decades, Hindus have spread all over the world through immigration. Like in the United States itself, we are probably three, three and a half million. In Canada, there are 500, 600,000 Hindus. And so with us, we've carried all these influences. Um, it's very important to relate what we are teaching to modern times. Um, and you can give certain examples, like in the United States now, one of the Democratic Party uh, presidential candidates was Tulsi Gabbard. Um, she's not a son, she's not a daughter of Hindu immigrants, but her mother was a Hare Krishna. And so when Tulsi Gabbard grew up, she decided to adopt Hinduism. And so she took her oath on the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and now we have our current vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, whose mother was an immigrant from Southern India. So she, she's half Indian by descent, even though she does not follow uh, Hinduism. <clears throat> so this is a summary slide that talks about um, the religious gifts of Hindus. You know, Hindus are every seventh human being in the world is a Hindu. But in addition, um, there are about four, 400 to 500 million followers of Buddhism and other Dharmic traditions. So overall, um, Hinduism has impacted about a fifth of humanity um, in modern times. In, in ancient times, the percentage was much higher because other religions hadn't uh, come into being. So when we specifically go to Southeast Asia, uh, there are several countries which are predominantly Buddhist um, and they actually follow a mixture of uh, Buddhist and Hindu culture. So if any one of you has been to Thailand on a vacation, that would be a good opportunity for you to convey some experiences. For example, if you, uh, if you are in Bangkok, there are temples to Bhagwan Brahma in, in right there in Bangkok. Um, if you've been to Kampochia to Angkor Wat, there's the largest Hindu temple in the world. But um, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of adults and teenagers have heard of the beautiful island of Bali. So one thing I emphasize is that Indonesia, first of all, the name in Indo itself means that it's very culturally Indian. Um, but of all the islands, 7,000 islands in Indonesia, the one which is visited the most is Bali. And that happens to be the only island which has a predominantly Hindu religion and culture. And um, so what does that show? That our culture and religion is so beautiful that it continues to attract people from all over the world. Um, you know, tourists don't travel to other islands because they find that the Hindu culture of that particular island is more, you know, something that charms them. So then I show them, um, you know, certain other pictures, how the Ramayana and the Mahabharat has spread to uh, Southern, uh, to Southeast Asia. And actually when you go to the Google classroom, there is this Ramayana textbook from, um, you know, and, and it shows how the how Ramayan was translated in practically every country east of um, India, east and south, south in the Southeast Asian country also. Um, then I also show them uh, images of uh, Hindu Devi Devtas who are worshipped um, in Southeast Asia. Um, 
So here's a slide, you know, when I mentioned that Brahmaji is worshipped in Bangkok, you know, this is a Murti of Brahmaji from Southeast Asia. And if you've traveled to Indonesia, um, their airlines is actually called Garuda Airlines. You know, it's right after the um, Garuda, um, you know, which is the Mount of Lord uh, Vishnu. Um, I also show them uh, pictures of some currency notes that I have. So again, like I said, it's for this class, a good treating, teaching strategies to keep a box and keep collecting those things that you can show. So here's a, um, a bill from Indonesia that has a Murti of Ganesh on it. And um, this is a carving a relief from Kampuchea, which shows the Mahabharat battle. Um, and then if you ever take your children to um, Thailand, or, uh, you know, everybody's heard of Thailand and Bangkok, you should tell them that when you land at the Ayupovan airport, um, you come across this beautiful Samudra Manthan motif in the bank at the Bangkok airport. And then you can ask them, you know, what, what, what does this represent if they remember the story, if they've gone through other um, Hinduism classes. So on this Bandrachal is Bhagwan Vishnu, uh, you know, and then you have the Devtas and the Asuras trying to churn the mountain um, with different gifts and different, you know, kinds of poisons. So the other thing I told uh, the children is that, you know, I don't recall the current king's name, but their, um, oh, the current capital is Bangkok, but the older capital of Thailand was Ayutthaya, which is named right after Ayodhya. And therefore the royal title of Kings of Thailand is Rama. So the older King was Rama the ninth and the recent, the current King is Rama the 10th. And this, um, you know, the previous King's name was Adulya Tej Bhumi Bal, which as you can see is Atulya Tej Bhumi Bal, you know, one who is the mighty uh, King of this earth and whose uh, splendor is unmatched. You know, that's, that's what it means. So showing, uh, giving values if of, you know, from real life, how uh, we've influenced um, is something very important. Now, um, the other thing when you show, when you pass around the coins and stamps and, and currency bills is to tell them that um, India literally, uh, you know, Hindus literally made a lot of these countries literate. And, and um, you know, so a lot of the scripts of Thailand, um, of you know Korea, and many other Southeast Asian countries are derived from um, the ancient Hindu and Buddhist scripts. And so this is a map. On, uh, you know, it's it's in the French language. I couldn't find the English version, but here's another map. And then you can uh, probably you know have them Google up these different scripts and probably also show them how they resemble the ancient scripts. So. Um, you know, one question is, you know, did these countries ever have Hindu empires? And the answer is yes. So there was a Buddhist empire called the Sri Vijaya, and there was a Hindu empire in Indonesia called the Majapahit Empire. Um, the interesting thing is that, you know, Indonesia is a great country, but it is this uh, Hindu empire, which they consider as their golden age of all, you know, historical times. So even though Indonesia is almost 90% Muslim today, um, it's that Hindu empire of Majapahit, which they consider uh, to be their golden age. And so this is an example of a giant uh, Buddhist stupa. Um, and then there'll also be a picture later on of, um, you know, the uh, of a giant Shiva temple in, um, you know, uh, sorry, the slides are just a little slow. So, um, and so there, there, there's also the Prambanan um, Hindu uh, temple that's quite uh, large and it's been restored. Um, so let's see the slide here. There. Um, now, another interesting fact, you know, the, these days, Kampuche is a very hot tourist destination. A lot of uh, Indian families from India and also from the West often take vacations uh, to visit the Angkor Wat. So, um, you know, this is something we are really proud of. Uh, it's the largest religious structure of any religion in the world. There is no larger church or mosque or any other religious structure in the world. And of course, this is the largest, you know, Hindu temple. So it was devoted to Bhagwan Vishnu. Um, and eventually the people of that area switched to Buddhism, but, you know, the, um, the culture still remains quite Hindu. 
Uh, one interesting uh, thing to tell the students is how Hindu culture has spread um, in Burma. So, um, you know, one instance to relate to them is that, and I remember this from my childhood, that um, just a day before our exams, there would be a mad rush to the temple because all the students would be praying to pass and get good marks in the exam. So uh, we would pray to Saraswati Ji, but likewise in Burma, they have the two the you know, a deity, which is derived from Saraswati. Instead of a swan, there's a rooster, but just like Saraswati Ji, she's carrying scriptures. So there are many other, um, you know, influences, Hindu influences. The major river of Burma, Iravati, is named after Iravati, which was the ancient name of the Ravi River, which flows through Punjab, uh, close to Amritsar. Uh, and the very word Burma is referred to as Brahmadesh in the Sanskrit scriptures. Um, and, um, you know, one unfortunate but interesting fact that I tell the students is that the Burmese royal family was uh, dethroned by the British in the 1800s, and um, they were forced to uh, move to a place in Maharashtra in the Ratnagiri district. And so their descendants actually still live there, although they live in great poverty, um, but the descendants of the Burmese uh, emperors, they still um, live in, in Maharashtra in India. So if somebody is from Bombay, you know, ask them, you know, if your parents are from Bombay. Um, Laos is another place which has uh, Hindu influence. So there is this example of, uh, you know, a ballet based on the Ramayana. Um, the interesting fact about the Ramayana of Laos is that Lakshman plays a more prominent role than Bhagwan Ram in the Laotian version. Um, Vietnam is an interesting case because it actually has one of the indigenous Hindu communities that exist still today. So in the, in the delta of river Mekong, uh, there's the Cham community, which is about 40 to 50,000. Um, and they still follow the Hindu faith. So they are kind of the lost Hindus that we've forgotten about. Um, so they've been living in an isolated existence, but they used to rule the Cham kingdom in that region. And even today you find these massive ruins of the ancient Hindu temples, the Shivalinga and Garuda and other in Devi Devtas. Now, coming to something more contemporary, um, you know, we being a global community always tend to know somebody who's living in Singapore or even in Malaysia. And so this is a picture of a beautiful um, Murti of Murugan or Bhagwan Kartike um, at the Batu Cave Shrine. Uh, and it's visited by a million pilgrims. Actually, even people from, even Tamils from India uh, now travel to Batu uh, ways to celebrate the Thai Pusam uh, festival. Um, and then I have a book on Singapore that I show to them, and it says Singapore, and in brackets, the Lion City. And the connection is quite obvious. Uh, Singapore, Singha means, you know, a, a lion, and so it's the Lion City. Um, and so, um, and, you know, we tell them about, I show them coins of Singapore, which also has the currency written in the Tamil script there. And, you know, you can Google and show them some pictures of temples from um, Singapore. Uh, Philippines is, uh, there are a lot of Filipinos here in the United States um, and, you know, the, their language is called Tagalog. Um, and today Filipinos are predominantly Christian and then there's a Muslim minority. But nevertheless, you know, Hindus uh, influenced Indonesians to become Hindus and then Indonesian Hindus took our religion and our scripts to parts of Philippines. So there are old inscriptions um, you know, Filipino documents written in Sanskrit. And you can see the script is very similar to, um, you know, Indian scripts. Now here, what I do is, and I should probably take a photograph of that, um, just like every, the Indian constitution has a preamble. Um, the constitution of Indonesia also has a preamble. And every third word in the preamble is very similar to Sanskrit words. So, you know, that shows how much the uh, Sanskritic language has influenced uh, Indonesian, um, you know, political culture and administrative um, um, norms. So, so that's a picture that I'll take and I'll post in the uh, classroom and you can show, um, you know, that every third word literally has a Sanskrit origin. Even when we go far into Mongolia, um, you know, we, we talk about the Mongol invaders, you know, coming and invading India in the form of Mughals, but, um, before that, uh, through Tibet, 
the Buddhist influences reached Mongolia and uh, along with that also went a lot of Hindu deities. So till recently, Mongolia was a communist country. They had stamped all religion, but now there's a revival of Buddhism there. Um, so this is an interesting fact that the symbol of Ulan Bator, the capital city of Mongolia is actually Garur, um, you know, the Mount of Bhagwan Vishnu. So here is a map um, that you can show, you know, teaching how in, uh, Buddhist missionaries, they went to different parts of Central Asia and Eastern and Southeastern Asia. Um, and so China today is a very powerful country. It's rivaling the United States for uh, primacy. But uh, till the 70s, uh, you know, 80s, India and China were pretty well matched. And so till those times, you know, the Chinese intellectuals didn't have any hesitation in acknowledging that, um, that Indian, Indian culture and religion has had a profound influence on Chinese civilization. So here are some quotations that you can show to them, you know, that how India was China's teacher in religion and imaginative literature. Uh, one thing other you can show to them is any book on uh, the Chinese travelers to India. So um, two of the best known travelers are Fahin and uh, Huan Sang. And so there are books on them. Um, and so this is an image showing how he's taking back the um, Buddhist scrolls from India to China. Um, and I also tend to have a Chinese translation of the uh, one volume of the Tripitak. So, um, you know, those kind of objects are very um, useful to show to them. Um, I'll just move. And here are the next slide has a picture on, um, you know, the murtis of Buddha in, in China. And this being a large file, it's taking some time here. Um, and following that, um, you know, so, so we, uh, most of the children were born after 2001 when the Bamiyan Buddha's uh, Buddha Murti was destroyed in uh, by the Taliban in Afghanistan. But that you know this offers an opportunity for you to educate children about the destructive um, behavior of the Taliban and how they've been um, trying to suppress you know Indic influences um, and promote their own ideology in that country. So. Um, you know, it's a Bamiyan Buddha, and then this is a Murti from China. Now, uh, Feng Shui is another very, um, you know, uh, uh, an art or, you know, science or whatever you'd like to call it that's gaining in popularity. So one thing to educate the students is that there is an, a more ancient Hindu version of Feng Shui, which is called Vastu. And it is said that uh, the Buddhist monks took the principles of Vastu Shastra and that eventually evolved into Feng Shui. Another very less known fact is that the traditional Chinese astronomy is straight away derived from Hindu astronomy. Um, and um, so again, you know, I can, I can post references from um, recognized literature. Uh, when we jump to Japan, uh, you know, Japanese, they follow a mixture of Buddhism and Shintoism, but they also worship a lot of deities, Devi Devtas, which are versions of the originals. So Ben Saiten is Saraswati, and they worship Brahma as Bonten and Ganesha as Shoten. And in their monasteries, they, until recently, they used to perform the Havan. Um, and so, um, and they the Japanese tend to study the Buddhist scriptures in a different script. The Japanese script is not an Indian derived script, but for Buddhist scriptures, the monks still use a script which is derived from the old, uh, you know, Brahmi um, script. Then another feature which we are all familiar uh, with is the bonsai. Um, and again, this is uh, derived from the ancient Indian practice of our sadhus and acharyas taking these medicinal herbs which were dwarfed, you know, so they would uh, walk over long distances and they might need those aushadis, the herbs. And they say that the bonsai itself derived from that. Now there's not much proof of that, but the parallels are quite interesting. Uh, another interesting example to talk about is the um, Korea. Um, and the Korean script, even though it looks a little bit like the Chinese and Japanese is actually quite different. And that script uh, of Korea is, uh, you know, it was derived, uh, it's called Hangul, 
and it was um, you know it was derived from the Siddham script from India and the Tibetan script, which was itself derived from an Indian script. Uh, the the Korean royal family has a very special relationship um, to India, and you should probably Google and show them that how descendants of the Korean royal family claim that um, they 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 are originated they have originated from a royal house in Ayodhya. So when a long time back. Um, a princess from Ayodhya moved to Korea. She took with her a pair of, um, you know, fish made of stone, and this is still preserved in Korea. And um, you know, the geologists have confirmed that the stone that's used for this sculpture is actually from the region of Ayodhya. So um, you know, they are they are very proud descendants of the um, Surya Vanshis of Ayodhya. So that's the deep connection that Korea has. Um, everybody knows about the, um, the great heritage that we share with Tibet and with the Chinese Turkestan or Xinjiang region. A lot of our kids have heard about the persecution, ongoing persecution of Uyghurs in, uh, by the Chinese, but um, before they became Muslim, they were actually followers of Hinduism and Buddhism. And um, Tibet has still preserved thousands or maybe millions of manuscripts. Um, and uh, this is not very well known, but interestingly, the oldest Vedic manuscript actually comes from Western Tibet. Um, if you are familiar with the Yajurved, in the Shukla Yajurved, um, you know, it has 40 chapters and this particular manuscript has the first 20 chapters. And so uh, a photo photographic image of this manuscript was very recently uh, published from the Harvard Oriental series. So that's, you know, something that you can talk about that. And of course, the Kailash Mansarovar, where we undertake pilgrimages is right in the uh, Tibet region. Um, and then when we've covered the East, we go a little more to the Central Asia and West, and we talk about Afghanistan. The very name Afghanistan is first found in the uh, Vayu Puran from around 500, um, you know, AD or CE. And they are referred to as the Highlanders or Avagan. Um, and so, um, you know, when we talk about Hindu communities in different parts of the world, I'll show more pictures um, of Hindu and Buddhist deities which are found in Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, the last few survivors who Hindus and Sikhs, they're, they're fleeing um, Afghanistan. So it's an opportunity to educate, uh, you know, our children also what kind of a situation um, the people there are facing. Uh, and then, um, then we talk about how uh, different Hindu sampradayas like uh, the Pashupat, you know, Shaiva tradition and the um, Sikhs, um, you know, they, they moved to Afghanistan. And um, so the tradition is that the third Sikh guru, Amar Das Ji, um, instituted, I don't know, 22 or 26 uh, major uh, manjis or, you know, his uh, disciples. And so one of them uh, went to Kabul, which has Gurudwaras from the times of the Sikh Gurus. And it also has Ashamai and other temples, which are thousands of years old. So, um, you know, um, in our community here, we've been lucky to have some Afghan Hindu refugees. And so sometimes when they are available, I've invited them to talk about their heritage in Kandhar and uh, Belgram and other places where they lived and how they are not just recent immigrants, but they have been living there for thousands of years. So um, there's a little more focus that I give to the United States because I've taught my class in the US. Um, and so I tell them how, you know, Hare Krishna's are a major, uh, are a popular site here. And Satguru Shivai Subramanya Swami has actually now started a, a, an American lineage of Shaivite Hinduism. So um, sometimes in my class, I have students who have been to the Khoi Island in Hawaii. Um, and sometimes they've even been to the Shiva temple. Um, and then um, it's also a good opportunity to introduce them to the Hinduism Today magazine, um, their websites. Um, and then, um, you know, I talk about this, uh, this article by Lisa Miller. So I send them a PDF of this where um, the journalist says how uh, accepting different cultures and respecting them, not just tolerating them is a very Hindu virtue and how Americans in that sense are becoming more like Hindus. So a century back, uh, the, the common American was very intolerant 
of um, other cultures. So for example, I live in Minnesota and there were distinct townships. There was a place called St. Cloud, which is a very Catholic town. And even today, the old people from St. Cloud tell me that even when a Protestant family would move into the town, that would be like the talk of the town. Hey, a new Protestant family has moved in. So in, in these seven or eight decades, things have totally changed. You know, the American society has become very accepting of other faiths and cultures, but you know, that's something we Hindus have practiced for thousands of years. Another interesting thing to talk about is the, um, the Grand Canyon area, uh, where one of the four major explorers was very well read in the Hindu literature. And so a lot of these artifacts or, or geographical features have Hindu names. So there's this Krishna shrine. Um, if you tour, you can actually see them. Um, there's another peak which is referred to as Brahma temple. And there's another artifact, um, you know, peak which is referred to as Shiva temple. So, um, you know, so the Hindu names are now found in um, geography. In more recent times, um, Hindu influences have been brought to the United States by a lot of gurus and swamis. So if you're associated with a temple, um, it's quite common, you know, maybe once or uh, once in a year or once in two years, uh, visiting a uh, prominent Acharya or Swamiji from India will visit your temple. And so they have a lot of um, disciples, a lot of following, which is not necessarily of Indian origin. Um, so make it a point to bring at least your own children to that following so that they can see for themselves how universal our tradition is. Uh, one big influence that we've had is the proliferation of yoga. Um, and today there are probably more practitioners of yoga and we'll come back in more detail during our last 15 minutes of discussion. Um, yoga has is practiced by 25 to 30 million people in the United States alone. There are yoga studios and, you know, there, it's, it's quite a big business, you know, the, there are yoga mats and they say that, you know, the yoga mat and other yoga, um, you know, um, the market is like about $2 billion. Now, a lot of people in the United States tend to associate yoga with Buddhism. Um, and the thing is, it's, the impression is changing, uh, but, but, more people need to be educated. And, and so yogic practices actually predate Buddhism. So this is an interesting slide to show how uh, we find terracotta figures uh, from um, sites which are from 2600 BC, 2200 BC, which show different yogic postures, whereas Buddhism itself is from you know, 550 BC. So the uh, yogic tradition is 2000 years older than that. Um, if you have, uh, again, if you have teenagers or even parents in your class, they will definitely know about Aveda cosmetics. Um, and Aveda, in case you didn't know, um, is the short form for Ayurveda. And it's his founder, uh, the founder of Aveda cosmetics is no longer alive, but um, he was a disciple of Swami Rama uh, of Uttarakhand. And, um, and so Swami Rama inspired him to start a more holistic nature-based uh, line of cosmetics. And um, I mean, these are really very good quality cosmetics uh, that um, a lot of teenagers in the United States might be familiar with, or at least their parents will be familiar with. So, so, to, you know, so it's interesting to tell them that Aveda is um, derived from the Hindu uh, traditional medicine. Um, and in, in our case, specifically in Minnesota, they used to be headquartered right here um, in, a, in a town called Blaine. Um, and now they've been acquired by another company, I believe by L'Oreal, which again is a common name that the teenagers will know about. Um, and then we also talk about how every fourth to every third person in the, uh, in the West now accepts Karma and rebirth. Karma has become a, a word in the English language. You know, people just use karma in everyday uh, conversation. And then, um, you know, even though Christianity, Islam, and Judaism reject the notions of rebirth, but um, a lot of Judeo-Christian um, families they follow it. Um, and um, you know, I give people some statistics that in 1982. Um, just about 2% of the population here in my state, Minnesota, and you might be able to find similar figures for other states or other parts of the world also, 
only 2% people opted for cremation. But at this point of time, more than 70% people in my state opt for cremation and not burial. And cremation is a very traditional Hindu practice. It's much more um, environmentally friendly. It's, it's just more easy on land use and many other factors. So, so that's again, you know, um, a very traditional Hindu practice. In my own family, we have relatives who are not from of Hindu origin or Indian origin. Um, and, um, you know, they've started cremating their parents, but uh, they don't know what to do with the ashes. So I came, you know, one of my uncles, he has preserved the ashes of his mother. And I told him, no, I mean, in the Hindu tradition, you should let these ashes, you know, flow in a river or in a pond or in the ocean, or you should bury them. Um, and so he asked me in detail about it. But, you know, that's, it's a new practice here in the West. And so it's an opportunity for us to um, educate the people around us on what to do with the ashes. Um, now, um, you know, Mahatma Gandhi tends to be a brand image. Um, and, you know, it's certainly we should capitalize on that. Um, he's the poster child for the great Hindu value of ahimsa. And um, so the word ahimsa itself is becoming common now in the, um, in, the lang in the languages of other parts of the world. And one of the um, offshoots of ahimsa is um, the emphasis on vegetarianism. One thing I do mention, this tends to be a very divisive topic amongst Hindus. Uh, one of the things I do mention to them is that Hinduism does not require you to be a vegetarian. And really only a fourth to a third of the Hindus are vegetarians. But most of the other Hindus don't eat much, uh, much meat. A lot of people say won't eat meat on Tuesdays because it's a day devoted to Hanumanji. Um, a lot of people give up meat when they turn old, um, but it's derived from this value of vegetarianism. Uh, and, and, and I also contrast the Hindu view of animal life compared to what the other traditions say. Animals are not just a natural resource that we should exploit but they, they also have a soul. They have a spark of the divine and eventually they will also attain moksha. So they also feel pain. They also have families. And so we Hindus have always recognized that animals are, are you know, uh, life. Uh, whereas if you, um, and you know, one of, some examples that I give is that um, today in the West, um, around Christmas time, a lot of people will take their pets to get blessed and a lot of churches will turn them away um, because they say that animals don't have a soul. Uh, and coincidentally, you know, within a week from now, um, at our local temple here, we have a Shwan Puja ceremony where people are encouraged to bring their pet dogs and have them blessed by the pujaris and have a puja performed for them. Um, and so we Hindus have always respected animal life, plant life. Um, the other thing which really empowers Hindu um, teenager girls and women is that um, amongst the major religions, we are one of the very few which actually has a full developed feminine theology. So, you know, we chant the shloka tvameva mata cha pita tvame. And so the mother, God is recalled uh, as a mother before we even think of him as, as father. And so, um, you know, a, a trip to a temple is very useful if your classes are being conducted at the mandir. Just take them around and it's in your face. You know, you, we have murtis of Durga, we have murti of Sh Saraswati, Parvati. Uh, in our own temple, we have uh, seven or eight uh, images of dev devis. And uh, whereas if you, um, you know, go to other religious places, you know, the predominant understanding of God is as a masculine figure. Um, in Catholic churches, you will probably find Mother Mary. But beyond that, you know, um, there, there's not much equality on a theological level. Um, and then we talk about uh, the New Age movement. If you go to any large bookstore here in the United States, there's a New Age books section. And if you look at what topics those New Age books cover, it's like rebirth, astrology, um, you know, reincarnation, past life recollection. Um, so these are all traditions and beliefs and ideas which have been taken from the Hindu tradition, even though they often get very mangled and distorted. But in, in reality, uh, the New Age movement exposes um, 
people in the West to many Hindu concepts. And so when they start exploring a little bit more, they actually find the authentic original source of these traditions. So, um, you know, coming to the, again, keeping in the West, you know, um, there is not much proof, but there is a lot of suggestion that, um, that the Hindu Buddhist culture has had influence on Greek philosophers, even like Pythagoras, who believed in rebirth, and he was also a vegetarian. There is a tendency amongst Eurocentric um, scholars to say that everything came to the Hindus from the West. But when you look at the chronology, it tends to be the other, other way around. Um, and so um, there are some nice charts to share with them. Um, you know, there's a, here's a table, um, the next slide has a table that compares the Greek deities to the Hindu Devi and Devtas. And um, so I show them a book by Nicholas Kazanas, who's actually a Greek scholar. And he argues that the Greek deities were derived from the uh, Devi and Devtas, Devis and Devtas in the Vedas. Um, then there is also another uh, book which explores the connections between uh, Christianity and um, ancient Hindu and Buddhist concepts. Um, and so I have a copy of that book. It's very easily available on Amazon. So you should probably buy a copy of it. And um, it's by a Christian scholar. And it shows how a lot of the Christian practice Practices and you know things even like the story of Jesus in his childhood where King Herod killed all the babies you know that has a parallel in the story of Krishna where Kans tried to kill every baby and he sent Putna um, and so there are a lot of parallels and if you look at the things chronologically the obvious conclusion is and there's no evidence for the transmission but uh, you know there's conclusion that um, um, suggestion that this might have traveled from the Hindu and Buddhist communities. Um, so after Christianity, we come to Islam, and it's the Sufi tradition, which in its early days had a lot of influence. Um, and what I do is I show them a translation of the Amrit Kund, uh, which was a, a you know, Sanskrit manual for pranayam, and it was translated into um, Arabic. So I'm going to upload some of these resources that I have digitally, um, and then you can you know, save them on your computer. Um, and then, um, you know, there are translations of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and Sankhya Darshan and Gita. And um, now Rumi's name is very famous these days. Uh, and people typically think that Rumi, you know, because he lived in Turkey and in Iran, maybe he was from that region. But actually, Rumi was from a place called Balkh in Afghanistan. And then he traveled west and, you know, spent most of his life in Iran and finally, you know, in, in um, Turkey. And so this Balkh is referred to as Valik in um, ancient Sanskrit scriptures. And so there, and, and it was a, there was a big community of Buddhist uh, monks in Balkh in the early days when Islam, um, you know, Islamic forces invaded Afghanistan. And so, um, you know, the Sufis are considered heretics in the Islamic world, even though, um, you know, they have a following in the West, but only about 1% of the Muslims follow Sufis. And one of the first things that, um, you know, um, people in say, Tunisia and other countries they have done when, you know, Islamists have captured power is that they have destroyed Sufi shrines and Sufi tombs because they say that this is not true uh, Islam. But um, you know they they do share some similarities to uh, Hindu mysticism, uh, not always, and the source is most likely the Hindu and Buddhist tradition. Um, coming to Europe, um, you know, students uh, when they are in the teenage years, they they take AP classes in European history or uh, world history, so they are they are somewhat familiar with the Age of Enlightenment and what's Romanticism. Um, and so these are some very nice quotes, um, and there are books written by the on on these um, you know intellectuals that that where they clearly acknowledge that uh, they came out of the shackles of their Judeo-Christian heritage after they were exposed to the spiritual uh, teachings coming from the Hindu community uh, here in the United States. Uh, the founding, a lot of the founding fathers uh, were deeply influenced by um, the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads. Uh, likewise, coming closer to our times, uh, very prominent 
um, writers and literary figures have acknowledged how much they owe to the Bhagavad Gita. Um, I haven't updated this slide deck, but in recent times, you know, there have been sports persons who have, and even Hollywood actors who have come to the, um, you know, uh, adopted Hinduism. Julia Roberts is an example. Um, and, you know, so um, then this one, you know, kids are very scientifically minded. And so here's a quotation from Albert Einstein on how much he thought, you know, the Bhagavad Gita's teachings are quite grand. Um, here's a British historian. So you can show these to them. I'm not going to read all of them. Um, there's a German philosopher here. And then Mark Twain, um, a lot of people are familiar with. They sometimes have readings in their classrooms. Then um, this is kind of an ironical example. Uh, Oppenheimer, who's the father of the nuclear bomb, um, but he was also familiar with the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. So um, what do we have to offer to the world? And we all keep reading a lot of negative things, you know, about different communities fighting with each other, killing each other, ethnic cleansings, terrorism. And so uh, one thing that we Hindus are justifiably proud of is that we don't believe that universalism and unity is equal to uniformity. Everybody has a right to follow their own culture, their own way of life, as long as they don't infringe upon my way of life. And likewise, I don't have a right to suppress other cultures and civilizations. And that is a very core Hindu value right from our most ancient scriptures. And that is what Lisa Miller wrote in that article in the Newsweek that uh, we've all become Hindu now. What she was acknowledging is that this is a very core and ancient Hindu value, which is now being taught in the West in the name of diversity and you know, tolerance. But this is something that we Hindus have always um, practiced. When we, and you know, there isn't much left now, I'll quickly go over. So when we come to the field of you know, arts and literature, um, you know, people know about gypsy dancing and you know, um, country dance like waltz and foxtrot, um, Spanish you know, um, dances. Uh, one interesting thing to mention is that the oldest stringed instrument is the veena. Uh, which is mentioned even in the Vedas. And so it's like the parent of all the stringed instruments in the world today. Um, this is the age of science. So it is very important to teach children um, the scientific contributions. Um, they've all had some experience with Roman numerals and they all know how cumbersome it is. Um, so it's interesting to tell them that the whole um, place value and the base 10 arithmetic system, um, the number zero, the decimal system, um, they've all originated from Hindu medicine. Uh, and this is an interesting picture to show to them. Um, and um, Sanskrit has words for numbers even, you know, 10 to the power of 145. English language or any other language in the world, even today does not have anywhere close to that. Um, so we have a base 10 arithmetic, but then we also have a base two uh, number system. And that was also used uh, by ancient Hindu mathematicians, but specifically in um, what we call the Chanda Shastra is where, you know, they use the binary system, which is not today used for, for you know, computer coding, you know, people who are computer engineers would know better than that. Um, and then the Pythagoras theorem should really, uh, the name should be changed because it's found in much older Hindu scriptures uh, like the Baudhayan and uh, Shilba Sutra. The, um, and likewise, um, I have a book that I show to the students uh, and it's a book on Arabic astronomy and mathematics. And uh, it is called um, Hisab al-Hind, um, which is very clear that you know, Hindu mathematics, you know, how it was translated into Arabic. So there are some things, you know, we have to show up. So, so students typically learn um, in school that the number system that they use are Arabic numerals. And so you have to tell them that Europeans call them Arabic numerals because they learn them from the Arabs. But the Arabs call these numbers as Al-Hindasa because they learned them from the Hindus. So um, today, some textbooks have started correcting that and they call them Hindu Arabic numerals, but 
you know, that's something we must point out um, about, you know, our heritage. Then there are all these examples on, um, you know, astronomy, um, gem science. Um, India was the only source of diamonds till the 1700, um, largest producer of silver. Um, and it was a very, very <clears throat> sophisticated and a very um, scholarly civilization. So there were 64 traditional recognized arts and there are shastras on all of these kalas. So there was a gemology, uh, you know, there are several uh, books on gemology like Ratna Pariksha and Rasa Ratna Samuche. There are similar scriptures on um, plant uh, medicine, on agriculture, on metallurgy. Um, so if you have, um, you know, any of those books, they are very cheaply available. Um, and again, I'll post a list. You can probably order them and put them in your box to show that uh, there is there is even a, the Hasti Ayurved, which is the um, science of elephants. And uh, the those books are so sophisticated that it was not till late 1800s that uh, Western um, veterinary science caught up with what was taught in the Ashwa Ayurved and the Gaj Ayurved. So, um, so then, uh, you know, metallurgy, gem science, we have already talked, spoken about that. Then this is also an opportunity to talk about the um, iron and steel technology in India. Uh, you can show them a picture of the iron pillar in Mehrali in Delhi, um, that it hasn't rusted, even though it is, uh, you know, 15 centuries old. Um, and then, um, you know, this is on a funnier note, people, some people um, hate certain vegetables um, and uh, Hindus were the first to cultivate things like certain varieties of rice, cucumber, tea, lemon, uh, mangoes, cotton, uh, cane sugar. Um, when Alexander came to India, they, they, you know, the Greeks only got sugar from uh, beetroot. So when the, the Greek chroniclers who came with him, they note that Hindus have a grass which produces honey. So they were referring to um, sugar cane or cane sugar. Um, so there are a lot of these different uh, everyday food items that have spread from uh, India. We have pictures, uh, we have seals from Harappan culture that show domesticated elephants. Um, one thing that we are really proud of is the, the sophistication of our grammar, our linguistics and our phonetics. Um, and before 1700s, the, um, the grammars of European languages were extremely haphazard. But when uh, scholars like Sir William Jones and others studied the Sanskrit language, um, they saw the Karak-based structure of Ashtadhyayi, the, the grammar of Panini, and, and they thought it so scientific that it just revolutionized how European language grammars were written. Uh, and, and it was because of the Sanskrit language and when they also studied um, similar neighboring languages like Farsi or Persian, they discovered that there's actually an Indo-European language so that gave birth to this whole field of modern uh, linguistics. Um, then, you know, we are all very interested in martial arts. And one thing to emphasize is that judo, karate, uh, kung fu, uh, a lot of these arts have derived uh, originally from the Kalari Payattu in Kerala. Um, and we Indians tend to be very poor at marketing, uh, but this is a continuously practiced martial tradition. Uh, it's still practiced in Kerala. Uh, and you could probably find some Google videos to show to them. <clears throat> On a more lighter note, um, here's a pair of die which look identical to what we use in board games today. The difference is that these are four and a half thousand years old. So ancient Hindus were inventors of the several board games like die and we've already spoken about chess. And look at these chess pieces, they look so similar to what we use um, today. And so there's a map here showing how chess spread to different parts of the world. And as it spread, uh, you know, it took on different names. So, you know, in, in um, Bollywood movies, you hear it as Shatranj, which is, which is really an Arabic word, but the, the original um, Sanskrit term is Chaturang. Um, so here's a picture of, um, you know, the cards, the playing cards that are invented by the Hindus. Uh, instead of the spade and hearts, uh, we used to have a Vishnu pack, a Shiva pack, a Durga pack. And so these, um, these Ganjifa cards, as they were called, they are still made 
at a place called Pend in, Maha, in coastal Maharashtra. So um, that's, you know, the, the playing cards originated from India. Then the Snakes and Ladders is a game which everybody's familiar with. And the tradition is that it was invented by Sant Gyaneshwar in the 1200s to teach, um, you know, good and bad values to students. So if you landed on a square, like say Satya, then you took a ladder. And the last, um, the last square on this board was Moksha. And if you landed on something like say, you know, stealing, then the snake will bring you down. Um, and then, uh, you know, here's again, something on a lighter note. I have copies of uh, Persian collections of staves like Khalil Dimma and, and you know, the four, I show them the foreword of that book, which shows how they were actually adapted from ancient Hindu uh, collections of stories like Shukha Saptati or Hitopadesh or Panchatantra. So um, this kind of brings us to, um, you know, our discussion. Um, and so we are right there. Uh, one of the questions that students ask me is that if we Hindus have made so many contributions and why is it that nobody talks about it? And why is it that nobody gives us any credit? Um, so um, I think we should kind of like unmute now. And I would like to, um, you know, share some thoughts with you all on how would you answer that question? So that's one question. Um, and then the other question that, um, that, that I raise is that, um, you know, yoga, anybody can practice yoga, even if they are not Hindu, but, you know, we see that there's a lot of distortion here in the United States and they don't even acknowledge our um, dharma as the source. So is that ethical? Um, and so, so we have some discussion around that, uh, but, but let's, um, you know, let me, I don't know if I can unmute everyone here. Can you all unmute yourself? So please speak up, um, you know, I don't want this to be a monologue and the last 15 minutes should be spent on discussion on, on how you would approach this topic with teenagers and, um, you know, how, so I see some things in the chat window here. Um, yeah, and somebody did mention that uh, the royal dynasty of, um, Thailand has the title Rama and current is Rama the 10th and Ayodhya. Uh, so in the Ramayan booklet that we have, which you can find on the Google class site, um, not able to unmute. Okay, I, I was able to now, <laughs> sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Just now. So, um, so what kind of questions do you think we might get from um, students or even adults in this class and and you know, one big question that I emphasize is that, you know, there's children are aware of, you know, open source resources like Wikipedia. And uh, Hinduism has a lot to offer to uh, modern hum humanity. And so the question is, you know, if, if they are going to take, say, things like Aveda, Ayurveda and yoga, is it, is it fair to then sell it back to us? Is it fair to patent what we have known for thousands of years. Um, so let me try to share with Salji uh, on your first uh, question that, uh, you know, that comes in the class from the students that how come the world does not uh, give credit to Hinduism and Hindus, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if they had so many contributions uh, over centuries and probably eons, uh, Right, many, many million years, maybe, if not hundreds of thousands, millions, if not thousands, whatever. So <clears throat> my thought goes to that uh, Hinduism is uh, uh, kind of has an emphasis uh, on individualism in terms of self-realization, moksha, uh, you know, so kind of you are self-contained and self-contented. So that emphasis perhaps has played role meaning not to be looking for accolades uh, from others, you know, like Brahma, you know, stays within myself, you know, and others also. So perhaps uh, 
that's that's one of the roots i would say uh, that might be playing a role uh, so that's what comes to my mind yeah. you know so for example you know even even when you you know talk about like proselytization so proselytization had, in my opinion my observation i should say has hardly been emphasized in hinduism whereas in some of the religions that we see in current world uh, you know and perhaps the reason could be hinduism is a little bit more ancient you know perhaps the most ancient you know certainly vedas are by far the or accepted by everybody the most ancient uh, you know scripture or literature available to mankind uh, right so uh, so hinduism did not have to perhaps look for conversions whereas you know, some of the newer faiths unless they do that how would they really increase their congregation so to speak yeah. so those are a couple, yeah. couple of thoughts that come to my mind yeah. to share with the students yeah so i think you know in a nutshell i mean the whole focus of hindu dharma is to overcome our ego my mine um but you know as a community you know it's not it's not always a very good strategy so at an individual level um i don't need any any recognition or accolades or prizes for teaching yoga but as a community when given the patent and and selling culture of the west if people are trying to copyright my yoga asanas just because they have created a vinyasa or a sequence in which they should be done and then sell it through their yoga studios and then i am being asked to pay for something which my forefathers have practiced that's not right right so um so that's what you know i emphasize to students that we need to take charge of our own heritage if nobody is giving us credit well we need to really tout it you know uh, here in the united states it doesn't pay much uh, it doesn't get you much if you are very humble when you're applying for a job you highlight what you have to offer to the company so similarly you know there's no use as a community being very humble uh, while we might not want to make money out of it yet we must not allow other people to uh, indulge in plagiarism you know steal from what belongs to all the hindu community in the humanity and then and market it as a sales so that's what i tell them you know i related to their in in schools and colleges here plagiarism is a big issue so i ask them you know that if you were to take an idea or lift sentences from a book and sell them as your own you would you know you would get a nasty note on your transcript or your your mark sheet and you would be blacklisted when you apply to colleges because you indulge in plagiarism so this is exactly what it is when people like deepak chopra you know they they copy the panchakosh vivek from taitri upanishad and they sell it as if it's their original philosophy that's pure plagiarism uh the other point i make is that uh, yoga is an eight stage or an eight limbed discipline and in the yama you know um, yama and niyamas you know satya being truthful is is one of the cardinal uh, principles and a person who's plagiarizing and passing a traditional wisdom as his own is being false is being you know untruthful so um so we have to um hold the mirror mirror to those people and um one another example i give to them is that uh, and people are shocked when i tell them you know the order of mother teresa sisters of charity they wear a white sari with a blue robe and you will not believe it but even that's a patented uh, it's a copyrighted thing you cannot publish mother teresa's image the sisters of charity can potentially take it to law court because they own those images likewise the vatican technically owns images of the pope so uh, you know the west makes a business out of everything and just because we are an open source tradition and people can benefit doesn't mean that they take ownership and sell back to us what truly belongs to us but i should give opportunity to some people who are raising hands so we have anurad anuradha ji um and uh please unmute yourself to ask the question hi vishal ji this is rohan here okay. uh, so so on that point which you made right uh, what what uh, why why do why do we 
why do you even get something like uh, yoga from west rohan rohan i think people have raised their hand i think they need to have a chance to speak first oh sure yeah. so i don't know anuradha ji is not uh, muted but i see ravi pathak ji uh, yeah. he unmuted can you raise your hand can you ask a question please sure yeah so basically actually it's not a question it what my observation is uh, you know when you mentioned that uh, google plays a important role right and it is it does actually for the youngsters for anything you say them they wanted to see it in black and white whether it's true or false is a different story uh, but they take facts from where it is written and how it is written and who is written it so wikipedia plays an important role yeah, unfortunately yeah yeah so what i would suggest is many of us who are you know part of this should contribute to a digital and you know write small snippet of things and or contribute to wikipedia or write articles blogs and other ways where wherever google can you know um, capture these type of information the more it is going to be there available in digital is uh, is one way of um, you know making people realize the facts yeah uh, so, so, i would say is that we should never contradict or fight science and technology um in little children classes we don't allow cell phones but in the teenager level classes you actually want them to use cell phones while you are there um and i know that some of them will use them for you know texting and uh, whatever but that you know as a teacher i constantly keep telling them so you know when i mentioned chanakya i say you know just google up chanakya and find out what does internet say about chanakya what what does it say about arth shastra so um you know it it kind of keeps them busy they will never let go of their um iphones so we have to you know they say that if you cannot defeat them join them so that's the strategy i have adopted in my class that you know i keep telling them look this up in google and look that up in google and look this up in wikipedia yeah. so and if there is some wrong information then i then we have a brief discussion on why this information is wrong and what's the real information um there is an a, there is a geography atlas which uh, you know the maps that used in the in classes right now for example they it, they show that greenland is bigger than africa because of the mercator projection where the europe your continent looks much larger but there are atlases which show different countries in their real relative sizes so what i use that to show that there is a very prominent eurocentric bias in much of the knowledge which comes to us even in the case of maps in geography but when you actually look at the map and you see how large africa india south america are and how small uh, europe is you know then that brings things to the right perspective but let me jump um, you know so we have a hand raised by sunil kumar uh, gajla ji and um, dagni dagni ji either of you could comment good morning sir this is sunil here namaste. this is sunil here yeah namaste uh, namaste sir uh, i'm feeling glad to participate in this webinar this kind of discussion sir uh, uh, we are able to know or the importance of hindu heritage and a main main my kind of observation is that what is happening here it is transformation from ancestors to the current generations has been frozen so that is the main reason why people are not aware of this particular heritage and so it, it is required that what you are doing and it has to be get explored each and everybody and uh, as previous people are saying in their discussion that they are raising that that we need to made it as a tech wish we need to made it in a form that everybody can explore it and we need to we need to just integrate these into our culture of education then definitely uh, this can be a fulfilled what i feel so my my thought to that is that uh, you know we can only shine the light in our corner of the room or in our own house and um, you know the governments will do whatever they have to but we should do whatever we can so in my own case you know having this seminar is one way in which i am trying to um, exchange information 
I, you know, teach at a local temple school and whenever uh, we are invited by the public high schools, I go there and talk about our heritage and our history. But like I mentioned, you know, I'm again sharing, let, um, sharing my screen. You know, this Google Classroom page has all of these materials that, that I will keep adding every week. Feel free to download it and use it wherever you can. Um, you know, if you if you are connected to a local temple, um, volunteer. You know, go to the management, or if you are a temple leader, already please start schools. If you um, if you get in, go to go and talk to your local public schools if they would permit you to offer a class. So so we have to try in our own community. Um, and you know, the bigger institutions can come later. If if we try to accomplish too much, then we don't start. As I say, a big journey always starts with a single step. So um, yes. we have to do truly whatever. Said, truly said, sir. Uh, I do Hila, my job. Hila, Hila ji sir. wants to um, have a com uh, make a comment. Akila ji. Hello. Good morning, sir. I'm calling. I'm joining in from India. Believe I'm audible. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I am really happy to see all the details that you have collected, and uh, really proud uh, that uh, there is so many um, bases to prove to our uh, posterity. But then, what is happening is there are many classes going on, like of Vedic heritage teaching program and other things that you have also said. But then, only thing is, what everywhere we are concentrating is only teaching what we have from we have in our history in our culture but then this uh, you have given very clear uh, proofs that others have taken from uh, here this and this we are not imparting to others that is the main problem so uh, in america uh, all children are really bold enough to oppose things and all that because that is there in them so if this details these details are also given to the children like in addition to what we teach from our heritage if we prove to them that this is how it has got a transition to others then they will be they will voice themselves of course we'll also voice it but then that details that uh, importance of, i mean what you have now given to us if that is given to the children also then uh, they will also become uh, um, i mean empowered to speak on these topics and uh, of course we have to your question on yoga and other things which they have patented that is really we ha we have to join together and then since you enough proof is there we have to actually um, oppose these things and raise questions need not uh, do it. just raise the uh, awareness of people so that then that will become a movement in itself that's what i believe no, and i'm so happy that i got this uh, uh, zoom meeting uh, share and i'm happy i'll surely join in i'm going joining in from india actually thank you so much sir so the problem is so bad that some people here in the united states try to patent haldi turmeric for use uh, as an anti-inflammatory agent. Um, yeah. I think 20 or 30 years back, somebody tried to um, patent one variety of basmati rice also. So um, <laughs> we have to, while we are, we are glad to share our heritage and our riches with others, we cannot allow them to take ownership and sell yeah. back to us. So, you know, that is where that Grihastha perspective comes in. Uh, my one issue I have with a lot of the other schools is that there is a very sannyas perspective. You know, we are universal, let them take it. But as a householder, you know, in real life, I wouldn't be happy even if somebody takes a hundred rupee note from me. Um, and so we have to be a little protective about our heritage, not for the purpose of necessarily profiting from it, yeah. but at least not let others yeah. use it against us. Um, yeah, we can allow others to use this, but then not to take advantage of our being quiet and then uh, start marketing as their own. <laughs> they should give us due credit. I mean, our heritage due credit. So um, heritage. just one more comment. Anybody who would like to say something and then we'll have the closing prayers. Hey, uh, hey Vishalji, this is Rohan here. So uh, I have one comment, right? So on the point which we made about yoga, so I, th I think one of the reason uh, traditionally we as a community have failed 
um, not as an individual sect or a, any following, but as a whole Hindu community, we have failed to uh, conserve our archives, right? And the one challenge I see when I go across with kids, especially with teens, uh, they always look things really black and white. They always need proofs and facts. Say, for instance, if you are talking about the rebirth and reincarnations, they will always like uh, ask the things about like, do we have a research or do we have yes. real proofs yeah. on that, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's where I think uh, we should be doing a yeah. little better job as a community. Yeah. So, um, so for each class, I will, in addition to the slides and a and a write up. You know, I am going to upload resources. So, yeah. like for example, for reincarnation, there is a four-volume encyclopedia of reincarnation from the University of Pennsylvania. I actually have a physical copy of it, which I show to students. And so there is there is tons of scholarly literature, uh, both by Hindus and non-Hindus. And so, uh, yeah. like for this particular class. I actually have a box of books and currency notes and coins that I show. So it's right, evidence is right there in front of them. So um, that's what yeah. we need to do. You know, we, the class needs to be interactive and, and yes. not just a lecture. So for example, on this class on reincarnation, when we come to that, um, you know, I have invited, uh, in the past I've invited uh, doctors associated with the temple. We've discussed aspects from parapsychology and neuroscience. And so when we come to that class, you will see there's a lot of interesting okay. evidence from science. And every year uh, we give a book or two to all of our Sunday school teachers. And one of the years there was a book on modern scientific perspectives on rebirth and reincarnation. So you're absolutely right. You know, uh, there's a lot of garbage out there in the internet. And then on the other hand, a lot of, um, teachers on our side make very baseless claims. And that really turns off our kids, you know, you know, to talk about nuclear science in 10,000 BC, you know, it, it really puts off our kids. So everything has to be very well referenced and documented. And, and that's the goal of this class that on that website, I will be uploading the references that you can use later on. Yeah, and I have one more logistical question. Some of these links I'm not able to access. I don't know whether it's just me. Please send a note to the uh, WhatsApp group and then um, one of the volunteers will take care of that. Okay, okay. So let's say um, the closing prayers. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makaschid Dukha Bhag Bhavet Tvameva Mata Chapita Tvameva Tvameva Bandhusha Sakha Tvameva Tvameva Vidya Dravinam Tvameva Tvameva Saravam Mamadeva Deva Om Asatoma Sadagamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Purna Madaha Purna Midam Purna Purna Mudachate Purna Sia Purna Madaya Purna Meva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 um, So next uh, week the topic will be the doctrine of Purusharth, Purusharth Chitushtya. You know, a question that a lot of us ask is what is the goal of my life? You know, we often see people who are very popular rock stars and then suddenly we hear that they committed suicide because there was a vacuum in their life. Uh, we hear about entertainers who make us all laugh, but they are themselves suffering from depression. So uh, in our Hindu dharma, we have a very beautiful framework called the, the Char Purusharths, the four Purusharthas. So, um, you know, that, that actually gives us a framework of the whole Hindu dharma, how things are structured, how, what we should be doing in our life. So, um, so I'll take that topic and then we'll also compare it to modern psychological theories like the Maslow's pyramid and other theories. Uh, again, you know, so that uh, our students can relate the modern to the ancient and, and, you know, see the comparison for themselves. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, please post them on the WhatsApp group. Uh, I know some of you sent me emails and texts, and I really apologize. I will be uh, replying to all of them in the course of time. Thank you very much.